tonight we're very lucky to have with us Peter Westwick, who's not only an award-winning author and historian, but a good family friend. Peter's written extensively on the history of technology, and his recent book co-authored with fellow Santa Barbara and Peter Newshall is called The World in the Curve, the his an Unconventional History of Surfing. Uh, Peter's a fourth generation Santa Barbara, born and raised here. He's now raising his two young sons and they're attending his alma maters. He's an avid surfer for over 30 years. Peter received a BA in physics and a PhD in history at Berkeley. He's now on the history faculty at USC where he directs the aerospace history project at the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West. When Peter's not teaching or writing, we can often find him on Miramar Beach surfing with his boys and giving impromptu lessons to my son and all the other kids on the beach. I'm delighted to introduce Peter Westwick. Thank you, Francie and Hank, for the nice, uh, generous introduction. And thanks to the Maritime Museum for having me here and hosting us tonight. I um, encourage you all to go up and take a look at the great exhibit on uh, Santa Barbara surfing upstairs. Uh, they got some great stuff up there, some great artifacts. Uh, I'm going to take kind of a big picture view of the history of surfing here, but also try to zoom in and try to catch some of the local angles uh, as we go along. Uh, but some of the stuff, uh, the history itself, is uh, sitting there upstairs. Some of you might be wondering, how does a historian of technology uh, come to write a book about surfing? So this one actually got started. Uh, I was at an academic conference uh, a number of years ago, and I met a fellow uh, historian of science uh, and found out that he actually also came from Santa Barbara and grew up here, uh, and that, in fact, he surfed, and most importantly of all, that he had a Boston whaler that would get us up to Hollister Ranch. Uh, so to go surfing. So that person uh, was Peter Nischel, who was my co-author on the book. And the, uh, Peter actually uh, was going to be here. He sends his apologies. He's actually up helping his two daughters move into their college dorm rooms uh, as we speak. So he could not make it tonight. Uh, but uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about is stuff that we worked on together. So anyway, several years ago, Peter and I were up at Coho, actually, on kind of a small day surfing. We're sitting there in between waves talking about you know, our day jobs, but how we could possibly combine our day jobs with uh, our other day jobs, uh, or other day avocation, and that was surfing. Uh, and we realized there was actually a lot of interesting intersections between history of science and technology and the history of surfing. So we decided to teach a class at UCSB uh, and got the uh, university to prove it. And as you might expect, the class turned out to be extremely popular. Uh, we had to turn away hundreds of students both times we taught it. Uh, the interesting thing was uh, both times we took a poll first day of class and just said, okay, how many of you here in the class don't surf? And most of the students raised their hands, uh, which is interesting uh, out at UCSB. Uh, so clearly non-surfers were interested in this cultural phenomenon of surfing and wanted to learn more about it. And then whenever someone we knew outside of UCSB heard that we were teaching this, this class, they'd say, oh man, we'd love to take that class. So clearly we thought there was a broader audience, uh, so we started working on turning our lecture notes from this class into this book um, here. Now, uh, a lot of people have written books about surfing, and some of those books are, uh, are very good, uh, but a lot of the existing surf literature is written by surfers for surfers. Uh, and a lot of it perpetuates mythology uh, or otherwise indulges in nostalgia trips. Uh, and we're trying with this book to chip away at some of these layers of nostalgia and mythology that have grown up around the sport uh, and try to bring some deeper analysis and some new perspectives uh, to it. Uh, and here is where I think our background as historians helps. Uh, what do historians do? Uh, we look at a seemingly isolated event uh, and try to see connections with what is going on uh, in the wider world. We try to see broader patterns instead of just single points. Uh, to put it more poetically, instead of just describing what's floating on the ocean surface, we try to peer underneath and look at the currents and the swells uh, that are carrying along all the stuff you see up on top. And in general, we try to answer the basic question, why did a particular development happen at that particular time and place and not somewhere else or not at a different time? Uh, why did it happen somewhere else? Why did it happen earlier or later? Um, and what else was going on that would explain why it happened there. Uh, so, for example, uh, why was surfing so popular in ancient Hawaii? So, uh, why was surfing so popular in ancient Hawaii? Uh, Hawaii was not the only place where people rode waves uh, in the distant past. 
But surfing became especially widespread there, and Hawaii was the eventual source of modern surfing. So why there, why then? Uh, one answer is in the geography of the Hawaiian islands, um, which meant good waves and warm water, uh, but also meant much more than that. Uh, the islands are one of the most remote places on Earth, thousands of miles from the nearest land, and that meant that anyone who could make it to those islands to settle them had to be phenomenal water people with a profound understanding of the ocean environment. Um, and once they got there, uh, the Polynesian settlers then developed their ocean skills into a ocean-based culture that had surfing in a central role. Uh, um, social, uh, social relations, um, political relations, cultural relations, religious relations all ran through surfing, gender relations uh, through surfing. So geography is one factor. Another factor for Hawaii was leisure time. Now any surfer knows that you can't surf if you're working. Uh, surfing then and now requires free time. Uh, the ancient Hawaiians could surf because they didn't have to spend all their time out working in the fields. Uh, they had a sophisticated system of uh, agriculture and especially fish farming, a really remarkable system of fish farming, provided thousands of tons of protein uh, a year, uh, which gave them several months of the year free uh, to go surf. So that's some of why surfing happened in Hawaii. Now, a lot of you might know the story about the subsequent decline of surfing in Hawaii uh, and the 19th century, uh, an obvious reason is that Captain Cook showed up uh, and sailed uh, into this bay in Hawaii uh, in the late 18th century. One great thing about this woodcut is if you look right down here, it might be hard for you all to see, but there's a little guy laying on a surfboard right there. Um, and this was something that runs through uh, almost all of the accounts of the early European explorers uh, who went on these voyages through the Pacific in, this, uh, in, the, void, in the era of exploration, uh, they came across these islands and all of these traveler's accounts, uh, they were struck by this phenomenon of the surfing uh, and these natives out there riding waves, standing up riding waves on these wooden planks and just thought this was miraculous. Um, anyway, uh, Captain Cook shows up uh, and the uh, Western contact with uh, Hawaii uh, has begun. Now, contrary to most surf histories, uh, surfing's decline was not caused by the arrival, subsequent arrival, of Western missionaries uh, who um, supposedly imposed religious strictures and tried to stamp out surfing. Uh, surf riders, I think, like to blame the missionaries uh, because if these uptight white preachers were against it, uh, that means surfing must be cool. Uh, and actually, this is, I think, some of the original, uh, the kind of origin myth of surfing is cool. Uh, cache is that uh, the missionaries were against us, and that what, that's what made surfing cool in the first place. Uh, but that's a myth. Um, there's actually several other factors involved. Um, introduction of a cash economy uh, instead of this uh, um, agricultural system built around fish farming uh, and other uh, sources of food. It, they switched to a cash economy, sandalwood first, and then whaling, and then finally the sugar industry. So the native Hawaiians, instead of having all this free time to go off and surf, they found themselves working in the sandalwood harvest or in the whaling factories and harbors and warehouses and docks or in the cane fields uh, and didn't have time to surf. Uh, so that's one factor. Uh, another factor is environmental pollution. Uh, all of these people coming into Hawaii, a lot of them concentrated in the boomtown ports of Honolulu and Lahaina. Um, in the meanwhile, abandoning uh, native precepts on sanitation and hygiene uh, and there's a reason that Honolulu was called by sailors all over the world the cesspool of the Pacific, uh, which does not exactly encourage people into the water. But the main factor uh, by far is the introduction of Western diseases uh, after contact. Um, the Hawaiian people uh, did not have any immunities built up uh, against all these diseases that the Europeans did, and a just devastating, catastrophic demographic collapse of the Hawaiian people uh, over the course of the 19th century. In just 100 years, it went from uh, several hundred thousand, maybe as close, maybe as many as a million people down to about 40,000. Um, so what happened was not that Hawaiians gave up surfing because of the missionaries, but it was that there were so few Hawaiians left alive to ride waves at all. Uh, surfing then require, uh, recovered around 1900, um, part of the development of a new economy based on tourism. And tourism promoters seized on this exotic sport as a way to promote the Hawaiian lifestyle, uh, specifically the beach lifestyle. Uh, so there's uh, photos like this. This is widely reproduced. This was on cards and posters uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, Diamond Head, of course, in the background. 
the Matson Cruise Line um, seized on surfing. Uh, you see all kinds of uh, tourism posters featuring surfing. Uh, along the way, there's interesting uh, issues about race and sex, uh, which I'll have to skip here in the interest of time, uh, but uh, you can read about it in the book. Uh, my kid's here. <laughs> Ken's like, we want to hear about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, that's the, the, a, a brief history of surfing in Hawaii. Now, the next question, how did this Hawaiian sport, this ancient Polynesian pastime, move to California? Why did California become so identified with surfing? Uh, people had surfed here before the 20th century. Uh, anyone here has read Two Years Before the Mast? Mr. Kelly? Have you read? Yeah, okay, good. Thanks, we got a few people. Uh, you remember the scenes of the Hawaiian crewmen surfing their longboats in through the waves uh, just over here at uh, Santa Barbara's East Beach, right? Uh, there's these great descriptions of the, these Hawaiian kanakas, as he put it, uh, surfing these boats in. Uh, it's tempting to think that uh, some of these Hawaiian crewmen at some point carved aboard and paddled out, but we have no proof of it. Uh, the real roots of Hawaiian surfing came in 1907 uh, with this gentleman, a young Hawaiian surfer, probably the leading surfer on Waikiki at the time. Uh, he was the mentor to Duke Ahanamoku. Uh, George Freeth uh, came to California. He started riding waves at Venice Beach first. Uh, Henry Huntington, a uh, famous name around California, uh, Huntington Beach. Uh, Henry Huntington heard about it and arranged for Freeth, might have paid him uh, to surf off of Huntington's real estate in Redondo. And that was the start of surfing in California. Now Huntington was basically doing the same thing the Hawaii uh, tourism promoters were doing and that is using surfing to sell the beach lifestyle. Uh, so for Huntington, surfing was a way to get Californians to come to the beach where he happened to own all the real estate and was then happy to sell it to them uh, at substantial prices. Uh, the real estate market here is not a recent phenomenon. <laughs> um, now at the time, Southern Californians thought it was more entertaining to go out to the San Fernando Valley and shoot jackrabbits from streetcars than to go to the beach. Uh, the beach was actually viewed usually as a dangerous place where your children were going to drown, uh, not as a safe place uh, to live and play. Uh, and people like George Freeth and Huntington's efforts uh, reversed this uh, and made the beach actually an attractive place uh, to live and play. Uh, and that was the birth of what was later called surferbia, not suburbia, but surferbia. Uh, that is the strip of these beach town suburbs going from, say, Pacific Palisades, Santa Monica, down through the South Bay to Newport, Laguna, eventually on down to uh, North County, San Diego, La Jolla. And I think you could include Santa Barbara as a part of Surferbia. So um, I'll kind of fast forward a little bit here. Our book covers a lot of the subsequent history of California surfing, uh, the post-war surf boom, Gidget and the Beach Boys and Endless Summer and all that. Uh, surfing's role in the 1960s counterculture, especially his role in uh, global drug smuggling, uh, as well as the Vietnam War. Uh, the emergence of pro surfing and the surf industry in the 1970s, eventually producing Santa Barbara's very own Tom Curran uh, as the first American world champ. Uh, we look at uh, women surfers, uh, surfing and issues of race in the lineup, uh, localism, surf tourism, uh, globalization of surfing, uh, the rival revival of big wave surfing, uh, and then of uh, we kind of return to uh, the surf industry, uh, much of which is centered here in Southern California. But again, this basic question, okay, we learned about why Hawaii. Now, why is Southern California? Why did Southern California become the epicenter of the global surf culture and surf industry? Uh, lots of places on this planet have good waves and good beaches. It's not just the waves and beaches. And actually, uh, around here, we know that waves here are actually not that great for long stretches of the year. Uh, and also, the water is uh, very cold for long <laughs> stretches of the year. Uh, so it's not the ideal place uh, for surfing uh, from that perspective. So as historians, again, we ask, what else was happening uh, in Southern California in this period? Now, a primary theme in surf history is the tension between two competing visions of surfing. On the one hand, in this one view, surfing is a natural, romantic, even spiritual pursuit. On the other hand, surfing is a middle class, mainstream, commercial, professional sport. Now, surfing's original appeal was this first view uh, as a romantic, natural lifestyle. Uh, that is romantic in the sense of anti-modern. Um, and that's why Hawaii, we think, is so important to the history of surfing uh, as the original source of that romantic connection for surfing, that romantic image. 
But as Western society became industrialized, commercialized, urbanized, uh, that only increased the attraction of literally turning your back on the modern world and jumping in the ocean. But surfing has also become deeply immersed itself in the modern world, in capitalism, globalization, the military industrial complex, and high technology. Now there are maybe 20 million surfers uh, worldwide today. Uh, surfing is a professional sport pursued around the world, a $10 billion global industry, give or take, driven by multinational corporations and mass marketing campaigns. This is the Quicksilver outlet on Times Square in New York. How did it come to this? How did surfing evolve from an obscure Polynesian pastime to a global cultural and commercial force uh, and high-tech sport? How did surfing go from anti-modern to fully modern? Why are there surf shops on Times Square? <laughs> and that brings us back to the question about California. Surfing's transformation came in part from modern science and technology, uh, and that came from California, uh, specifically from the aviation and aerospace industries uh, that defined Southern California for much of the last century, uh, and that includes Santa Barbara, as those of us who grew up here uh, understand. So I'd like to go here into that story in a little more detail uh, to show some of these connections, which we found surprising, uh, between modern technology and this Polynesian sport of surfing. Now the technology starts with surfboards themselves. Uh, Freeth board, if we go back um, to this picture of Freeth, um, is around 1900. It's relatively short, very hard to ride. Uh, basically, you're like trying to ride a door, <laughs> right? Um, so that's not going to entice a lot of people off the beach and into the surf. Uh, Duke Kahanamoku, one of his signal contributions was to introduce longer, uh, bigger boards that were easier to ride. The problem with those, there's a trade-off. Uh, that is, these massive redwood planks that Duke was riding, uh, well over 10 feet long, well over 100 pounds often. Um, and that limited surfing to world-class athletes who could handle one of these 100-pound boards and lug it across the beach and paddle it out through walls of white earth and then somehow turn this thing around and stand up on it and surf it. Now, Duke was a world-class athlete, fastest swimmer in the world, multiple gold medals in the Olympics. I uh, like to think of him as Michael Phelps and Kelly Slater rolled into one. Um, but for the average person on the beach, uh, surfing was not going to happen. So surfboard design has been ever since a constant search for lighter weight boards uh, with materials that are still waterproof and strong. They tried, for instance, balsa early on, uh, which is lightweight, but the reason it's light is because it's low density. Low density means it's basically like a sponge. You put it in water, it's gonna soak up the water and sink, uh, which is not good for a surfboard, generally. So first step came in the 1920s uh, with hollow surfboards, which cut the weight almost in half. Now this invention is usually credited to a guy named Tom Blake who showed up at this paddle race down in Newport Beach with a board that he had drilled out holes in the deck and then covered it with a thin layer of plywood. And this is usually hailed by historians as the invention of the hollow surfboard. But the story we think is more interesting. Um, if you look closely at the competitors on this list, uh, there's a name up there named Gerard Volti. Uh, who had been nipping, going kind of back and forth with Blake at that season's uh, races, the paddle races, all summer long. Now, Volti was a member of the Corona Surf Club, one of the leading clubs of the day, uh, accomplished surfer. He knew uh, Duke Kahanamoku, was good friends with him through the LA Athletic Club. In fact, uh, Volti and Duke had been surfing uh, a couple years earlier in Newport in the summer and made a heroic rescue of a bunch of fishermen whose boat had capsized in the surf zone. Uh, and paddled uh, these fishermen into the beach and got them heroic headlines in the LA Times. So this is Duke, of course, uh, Volte in the middle, and their buddy Owen Hale there, uh, flanking Volte on the other side. So Volte was an accomplished uh, surfer and paddler, but his day job was at Lockheed Aircraft. Uh, local angle here, the Lockheed brothers, of course, uh, started building seaplanes here in Santa Barbara before they moved to Burbank. Um, Volte had studied aeronautical engineering at Caltech uh, in the early 20s and then went to work for Douglas Aircraft and then landed at Lockheed, where he began designing a new plane with another guy named Jack Northrup uh, from Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara High School. Thank you. Uh, so Volte and Jack Northrup designed this plane, the Lockheed Vega, radical new airplane. It would be flown by Amelia Earhart, Wiley Post, all the other leading aviators of the day, set all kinds of records. 
the Vega design, the novelty really was the wing up on top. You notice it doesn't have the usual struts or supports connecting to the fuselage. This thin, thin kind of rounded shape uh, made out of plywood over wooden struts or ribs. Uh, this is the Lockheed factory floor. Uh, here you get a kind of better look at the way these wings are made. Uh, this is a stress test. So this is 1927 when Volte is working on the Vega. The next summer is this uh, Corona meet where he uh, hangs out with uh, Tom Blake on the beach. Blake is trying to build a lighter wooden surfboard. Volte has just finished making this lighter wooden airplane wing. And just a couple of months later after this, Blake debuts a hollow surfboard with, yes, uh, wooden struts or ribs and a plywood sheath around it. Uh, and by the way, then contracted it with aviation, with airplane builders to mass produce these things. Uh, you could also make them in your own uh, from kits. Uh, this is a popular science article on how to build one of these things yourself. Now, make a long story short, uh, the importance of the hollow board, cut the weight maybe in half from over 100 pounds to say 60, 70 pounds, uh, easier to serve, very popular with beginners. Uh, again, you could make your own from a kit in a magazine. Um, introduced many Californians to surfing in the 1930s, including this gentleman and his canine companion. So hollow board was the first step. Next step came out of World War II uh, and the military industrial complex. Uh, now surfing seems to have little to do with warfare. In fact, it seems basically the opposite of warfare. It's just the pure pursuit of fun. But in fact, surfing has had several crucial connections with military R&D. First, uh, through some crucial changes in surfboard design and materials uh, that came through the military in World War II, and especially this guy, Bob Simmons. A very interesting character. Uh, this is him, the guy on the left there, talking to uh, his young nepho, nephew, explaining the finer points of aerodynamics. Uh, grew up in Pasadena, uh, learned to surf on one of those uh, Tom Blake hollow boards. Then went to Caltech as a mechanical engineering major uh, in the early 40s. Um, the, that major at Caltech, ME major, included a couple years of advanced math and physics. Uh, also a full year of hydraulics, including theory as well as laboratory experiments in uh, hydrodynamics. Uh, Caltech had built a major hydrodynamics lab during the war, funded by the US military to develop uh, new airdrop torpedoes uh, for the war effort. Um, there's a backstory there which I could get into maybe in the question session if anybody's interested. But basically trying to figure out how to drop these torpedoes from higher altitudes and still have them hit the water and hit their target. Um, so this had a, this hydrodynamics lab, high speed water tunnel there on campus in the basement of the engineering building, these big 25 foot test tanks for testing uh, uh, hydrodynamic forms. And then this facility up in the foothills of Morris Dam, this basically shoot a torpedo down that ramp the thing would hit the water and then go across this fully instrumented test run across this lake bed, uh, and they would test different shapes for how they worked in the water. Now, we don't know if Simmons worked on this, uh, but his hydraulics class used all these facilities. He was also, meanwhile, moonlighting at Douglas Aircraft, uh, which built most of the uh, American torpedo bombers at this point in the war. So he intersected the research at both ends, both at Caltech and Douglas. So the upshot. He's immersed in advanced hydrodynamic theory, uh, streamlined bodies moving through fluids, uh, lift and drag, boundary layer effects, turbulent flow, all sorts of interesting stuff. You can read his reports, uh, or read the reports from this project in the Caltech archives. He was also connected to new aviation materials, uh, polystyrene and polyurethane foams, uh, fiberglass, polyester resins coming out of the chemical industries and applied at large scale for the first time in defense applications during the war. So Simmons combined these new lightweight materials. These are his receipts uh, from after war. These are from 1950 or so from Dow Chemical. Um, just showing where he's getting this stuff. Uh, combined the materials uh, with his hydrodynamic theories to revolutionize surfboard design. This is a Simmons twin fin. This is actually using balsa core with uh, the fiberglass and polyester resin over the top of it. He also experimented with uh, the polystyrene resin, basically styrofoam still probably recognized as the most important advance in surfboard design in the 20th century. And Simmons uh, is recognized really as the key guy. And he could make that advance because he was surrounded uh, by the wartime developments at Caltech and Douglas Aircraft. Uh, these boards made surfing way easier. Instead of a 60 pound board, now you're maybe down to 20, 30 pounds. Uh, this is Simmons test driving his board uh, at Malibu on a good south swell, maybe around 1950. Um, 
These boards also, first of all, much lighter weight, uh, also changed the geography of surfing. Instead of riding these really slow, kind of mushy waves like they'd been doing before the war, places like San Onofre, um, they now started, uh, surfers started flocking to point breaks like Malibu and then another little test laboratory they found up the coast uh, called Rincon. Um, and they also changed the way surfers rode waves. Instead of just kind of angling straight with a white water, uh, now you're cutting across the wave face um, and basically a whole repertoire of uh, maneuvers you could perform, uh, the hang 10, cut back, bottom turns, and the rest of it, Quasimodo. Um, hot dogging really is a means of individual expression amid what we think of as the conform conformity of the 1950s. And also, by the way, encouraged more women into lineups. So if you're a 16-year-old, five-foot-tall, 95-pound girl, uh, you might have been deterred from surfing by the prospect of a 70-pound board. But if you have a 20-pound board to pick up, uh, then maybe that's another story. And that's the case for a young Kathy Coner, who went to Malibu and got a nickname from the locals as Girl Midget, better known as Gidget. Okay, um, another development uh, coming out of World War II. Context here is amphibious warfare. In every major theater of the war, Europe, uh, the Pacific, North Africa, uh, the Allies had to move vast amounts of men and material from offshore uh, ships to fortified beaches. Uh, the problem for these uh, military uh, assaults became not, as most surfers think, when is the surf going to be good, but when is the surf going to be small enough to pull this off? Now, this photo here is from a, a military exercise uh, at the North Carolina Outer Banks. This is in 1941, uh, when they're just developing some of these uh, new techniques of amphibious assault. Uh, this is a landing craft coming in from the surf. A Scripps researcher by the name of Walter Monk saw this exercise and realized that if we try to do this uh, on an actual assault, uh, we are going to fail. Now, Monk was a Caltech physics major uh, who had gone to Scripps for grad school in oceanography. He's working with a Norwegian uh, named Harold Sverdrup. Uh, that's Monk on the left with Sverdrup. Um, Scripps was deeply involved in wartime research, especially on submarine warfare. Uh, submarine warfare, one of the most classified subjects uh, for the military. Problem is, Norwegian Sverdrup, the Austrian Walter Monk, can't get clearances to work on this stuff. Uh, so the military denies them clearances, so instead they look around for something to work on and they seize on surf forecasting, uh, forecasting the waves. Uh, and by denying their clearances, uh, the U.S. military may have won the war. Now, Monk's basic insight was to connect what's happening on waves on this little beach where we're standing to what's happening in the open ocean thousands of miles away where the storms are. Now, this is a pretty radical intuitive leap at the time that not too many people were making, but Monk made it said these waves we're seeing here, to understand where these, how big these things are gonna be, we have to know what's happening 2,000 miles away across the North Atlantic. Um, and he identified three basic variables, uh, which are familiar to surfers uh, and any uh, maritime people these days. Uh, wind speed, duration, and fetch. How hard the wind's blowing, how long it blows, and how big of the area of ocean the wind is blowing over. And if you take data on those three, uh, you can plug them into a theory and find out what the surf is gonna be like on a beach thousands of miles away weeks uh, or days later. Uh, the data raised an interesting question, uh, how do you measure a wave? What is a wave? What are you trying to measure? Uh, they came up with the concept of significant waves, uh, taking the average height and interval of the largest third of the waves and so on. Some interesting questions there. Anyway, uh, Scripps takes Monk's theory, um, sets up a school for forecasters and starts teaching these uh, oceanographers who then fan out to the various theaters and start applying this theory uh, for the various invasions. Uh, Scripps trained over 200 of these forecasters. And one of them is a guy named John Crowell uh, who was assigned first to North Africa and then to Normandy. Turns out that this guy, John Crowell, we went to look him up and found out that he lives about 100 yards away from me <laughs> here in town. <laughs> I uh, could literally probably throw a rock and, and it hit his place. Um, so we uh, trooped over there and did a fascinating interview with him. Really interesting guy, uh, still very active. Anyway, uh, Crowell's in North Africa. Uh, interesting story about the North African invasion. It, it, at that time, Roosevelt is writing to Churchill about what is the surf going to be like for this invasion. Uh, it's probably the first time, maybe the last time, the occupants of the White House and 10 Downing Street were both interested in the surf forecast. Anyway, Crowell then goes on to make the surf forecast for D-Day uh, in Normandy. 
and they were making these things they called nomograms um, for the various beaches. This is one for Omaha Beach. Uh, it's kind of hard to read, um, but you have down here duration uh, of the wind in hours, uh, wind speed in knots, and then you can kind of figure out and eventually arrive at uh, size of the surf coming from particular directions uh, for this beach. Now Crowell uh, and his colleague helped persuade Eisenhower to go for it on June 6th against the advice of several generals on Eisenhower, uh, Eisenhower's staff who wanted to wait a couple of weeks. Uh, and Ike and the forecasters turned out to be right. Uh, two weeks later, uh, Big Surf destroyed the concrete mulberries, these harbors they'd set up uh, on the beaches at Normandy and probably would have scuttled the invasion. Uh, Krull received a bronze star for his work uh, on D-Day. So to make a long story short, uh, Scripps refines his forecasting models after the war. The U.S. government deploys these networks of electronic buoys to uh, feed data in uh, to plug into these models, then added uh, remote sensors on satellites up in orbit, taking data on wind and swell size out in the open ocean. You feed all this thing into your computers, um, and today's surfer is now a mouse click away from getting detailed surf forecasts uh, weeks in advance. And all of that goes back to what these guys were doing in World War II for these amphib amphibious assaults. Now, one more military contribution uh, coming out of World War II, and that's the wetsuit. Uh, and there's you know, some examples here of uh, applications of the wetsuit uh, in the local uh, dive business here. Uh, but a lot of this stuff goes back uh, to World War II, and again, this context of amphibious warfare. Now, when they were doing these amphibious assaults on uh, North Africa or um, the beaches in the South Pacific or Normandy, they would send in what were called underwater demolition teams, UDTs, basically the forerunners of today's Navy SEALs. So these UDTs would go in and they would walk uh, the beach uh, underwater, uh, walk the reef flats uh, before the invasion, uh, cut the barbed wire, disarm the explosive mines, um, deal with the big hedgehogs or wherever else were, were designed to uh, trap your landing craft. Um, now the UDTs for places like Normandy, they would go in, they wear dry suits. Uh, now, I have not worn a dry suit, uh, but my co-author, Peter Nischel, has. Uh, his favorite comparison is to having your testicles clamped in a vise. And this is not, I think, a sensation you want when you're underwater disarming large explosive mines. So uh, the Navy has a uh, profound interest, uh, and the UDT members have a profound interest in improving uh, these suits. Uh, Navy turns to the National Academy of Sciences, which has a panel on underwater swimmers, and they uh, enlist... This guy, uh, Hugh Bradner, physicist, PhD in 1941 at, where else? Caltech. Um, worked on the Manhattan Project, uh, the atomic bomb at Los Alamos during the war, uh, then goes to work on this, with this panel after the war, and he comes up with a counterintuitive insight. You don't have to stay dry to stay warm. Uh, you can let water in, and then if you have some kind of insulating layer, uh, you will stay warm enough to function, and thus the wet suit as opposed to the dry suit. Now, Bradner also comes up with a material, neoprene, uh, another product of the chemical industries at that point. Uh, neoprene not just for warmth, but also for protection from underwater blast or shock. That is, the wetsuit was not just to keep the UDTs warm, but also to act as basically shock absorbers. Um, and you can see this in some of the correspondence from this committee. Um, now, Bradner doesn't patent the idea uh, in part because it's the product of government research, so the idea is available for easy commercialization. Then some other firms take it up, um, O'Neill, Body Glove, and some others, and then later some of these companies are arguing about who invented the wetsuit. Uh, well, um, they didn't invent the wetsuit. This guy did. Um, this is actually Bradner sitting at Caltech pool where he taught uh, swimming and water polo uh, while he was a student there. So wetsuit even further re revolutionizes surfing's geography. Uh, it's basically opened up the entire world to surfing. Surfing used to be pretty much confined to a narrow, mostly tropical, semi-tropical belt uh, around the equator. Uh, now there are uh, thriving surf communities in Iceland, Alaska, Ireland, uh, Vancouver Island, and British Columbia. They've actually got crowds up there, uh, crowded days. Uh, glacier surfing in the Arctic. There's been surf trips to the, uh, to the Antarctic. All of this made possible by the wetsuit. Now, I'm going to step back. Uh, note the role of Caltech in all these stories. Volte, Simmons, Monk, Bradner. Uh, most people probably don't associate Caltech with surfing. The popular image of the surfer is this. <laughs> Meanwhile, the image of the scientist or engineer is this. Or maybe this. Uh, 
the Hollywood version. But uh, in fact, there was a lot of overlap between these two images uh, of surfing here in California and between surfing and technology. And that's why surfing caught on here, not just because of good beaches and waves, um, but because of the aerospace and defense industries and research universities like Caltech, uh, which provided these new technologies that made surfing more accessible, uh, easier to learn, more fun, and basically more popular. And that's why by 1960, there's maybe 100,000 surfers in Southern California, where 40 years earlier, you had maybe 100 surfers. So from 100 to 100,000. Um, and what is happening in those 40 years from 1920 to 1960, Southern California has emerged as the aerospace capital of the world. So how many of us would surf if it meant lugging a 12-foot, 100-pound redwood plank to the beach and paddling it out without a wetsuit? Not me. Um, and there's a cor corollary to this, which I won't get into, but also the fact of the aerospace defense economy lifting millions of Southern Californians uh, into the middle class. And basically, the affluent society provides the leisure time for all of these middle class teenagers in the post-war suburbs who don't have to go work in the fields uh, or the farms or the factories or the mines. Um, they can go off and enjoy the bounty of, of the aerospace economy and just go to the beach. Uh, there's kind of one more example, which I'll just quickly skip over, but that is the device that's introduced more people, uh, including myself, to surfing than probably any other device, and that's the boogie board. Uh, invented by Tom Morey in the 1970s. Uh, what's his background? Math major at USC, composites engineer at Douglas Aircraft, Simmons' old employer, uh, then went on to Avco, another major aerospace firm, designing uh, rocket nozzles uh, a blade of, using a blade of fiberglass materials which he then applied to surfboard design, uh, including the boogie board. Um, some of you may recognize this gratuitous shot of my son uh, a year or two ago. Okay, um, surfers continued to experiment with technology. I'm gonna kind of fast forward through this. Uh, big wave surfing, toe-in surfing, uh, enabled some more advances. They're now fooling around with hydrofoils and some other exotic things. Um, but uh, I think we'll skip that. So we have, uh, over the last century or so, we've had surfboards, wetsuits, surf forecasting. Finally, we have to look at the waves themselves as potential products of engineering. Uh, and this goes back 100 years to the cradle of surfing at Waikiki. Uh, Waikiki around 1900 was no tourist destination. It was mostly wetlands. Uh, you know, the name Waikiki means spouting waters. It's from all the water that's flowing off of the hillsides into this flat plain on the coast uh, where the water collects in wetlands. In fact, this is where the ancient Hawaiians made a lot of their fish farms uh, in this wetland zone there. Uh, but that means there's no place to build hotels because uh, it's all wet <laughs> underwater. Uh, so when they did build the first hotels on the narrow strip of beach, they found that the surf often stripped the sand away before it was returned by the natural longshore sand flows, known as literal flows. And here you see an example of some of the early responses to this uh, as the sand began to disappear. They started building seawalls to protect the hotels. Then they started building jetties to try to trap the sand that's flowing along the beach. Uh, that didn't work as the sand continued to disappear. They actually began importing sand from California and spreading it on the beaches at Waikiki to have tourists, so tourists would have something to walk on. Uh, so we uh, suspect that most tourists in Waikiki had no idea that they were working, walking on little pieces of California. Uh, and then, of course, the Alawai Canal uh, drains the wetlands. Uh, the canal is this thing running along the length behind the whole beachfront at Waikiki. This is all flat land. This is all wetlands. Okay? And then they do canal. All the water flows out through the canal flows out here, of course, then they blasted channels through the reef, you can see here. Um, these are actually some of the channels from the original streams that flowed out, of which the Alawai has now rechanneled out through now this harbor, this artificial lagoon, which is called Duke Kahanamoka Beach. Anyway, you can see, and now, this is 1960 or so, now they've since built this thing called Magic Island, another, another huge project uh, on the other side of the harbor there. Anyway, uh, fundamentally changes the beaches and reefs there. The upshot being that Waikiki is really, uh, in many respects, an artificial engineered landscape, which is why it became this kind of Las Vegas for tourism, uh, because you couldn't, there was no place to build the hotels unless you did all this. Uh, now, you can tell t similar stories about many places in California where environmental engineering has fundamentally al altered the coast. Uh, this is a similar kind of aerial shot of Newport Beach, you know, the channelized Santa Ana River coming out of the top. 
Um, harbors, of course, uh, hard to see here, but the series of river jetties, uh, of the jetties going down that whole peninsula uh, without which um, most of those expensive homes along there would have long ago washed away. Sometimes these engineering projects create great waves, like the wedge uh, rebounding off of the harbor jetty uh, at the Newport Harbor. And of course, there is a, another example a little bit closer at hand, and that's our very own sandbar. Okay, I know everybody calls it sand spit, but when we were growing up, we called it sandbar. Uh, I'm sticking with sandbar. Uh, now, some of you probably know this history. Uh, some of you really know this history. I'm looking at some of the people out here. Uh, I'm kind of bringing coals from Newcastle here. But uh, so the story of the Santa Barbara Harbor, I think, is familiar enough to kind of go over quickly. Local residents clamoring, clamoring for a harbor even by late uh, 19th century. Uh, engineering studies urged that the harbor go in one of the existing wetlands. Uh, that was the standard approach at the time. You take a wetland and dredge it out, and there's your harbor. Um, instead, there was a proposal to just put a breakwater in close to Stern's Wharf. Um, now these, so the wetlands uh, proponents said, just put it in either down at what is now the Bird Refuge or out at the Goleta Slough. Don't put it in next to Stern's Wharf with a breakwater. So what's gonna happen is the longshore sand flows, that sand is just gonna collect uh, at the end of the breakwater and fill in your harbor. Uh, but uh, the city went ahead and built the breakwater anyway. Uh, encouraged by a couple of major donations from Max Fleischmann, who wanted a place to park his yacht. Uh, and so this is a photo circa mm, 1928, I think. Uh, and you can see, okay, here's Stern's Wharf. Here's what's now West Beach. This is a little pleasure pier they built up here. This is called Castle Rock. That's not Leadbetter. Leadbetter's up here. Uh, that's Castle Rock. Um, and we will see in this next photo, some of you know this stuff already, but that's Castle Rock. And sure enough, at first they just built the breakwater like this and it stopped right around here. Uh, then they pretty quickly realized they had to extend it to the beach. Sure enough, it collects the sand. You go from this to this in the space of just a few years. And then sure enough, a few more years go down and sure enough, the sand is collecting at the end of the breakwater and filling in the harbor. Uh, and that is why there is a, a dredge just a couple hundred yards away that pumps about 300,000 cubic yards of sand a year, uh, which is about the rate of sand flow down a lot of California beaches. That's pretty average, actually, for the uh, longshore sand transport. Uh, but if you do the math, it works out to be about a dump truck full of sand going down the beach every 10 minutes. And that's just that's going down beaches all the time. Uh, those dump trucks are just the sand is moving. Uh, and you put a breakwater in the way, and that sand stops moving. And a lot of sand then piles up. Um, so there's a happy byproduct. Uh, one happy byproduct, of course, is the harbor that we all enjoy here. Um, but the other happy byproduct for us surfers is this, um, a new surf spot. Uh, this is taken just a couple of weeks ago at that uh, Hurricane Marie swell. First time I've ever seen sandbar break on a south, uh, south swell. Um, but a less happy byproduct was beaches starved of sand down coast. Uh, places like Miramar uh, and Sandy Land uh, for a few years were uh, they were pumping the sand too far off the beach, so it got trapped basically in offshore canyons. Um, and some of these beaches were starved uh, of sand. And coastal engineering, of course, did not always create breaks. Uh, for one thing, I go back and I look at this photo. So we got, we got sandbar out of it, but I look at that photo and I wonder what might have been. Uh, did we lose a great another great break in the process? Uh, would Castle Rock have been a good surf spot? We will never know. Um, coastal engineering also destroyed a place called Stanley's, a fairly well-known local spot, at least until uh, around 1970 when they put in the, that southbound off-ramp to Seacliff on the 101, dumped all that rip-rap uh, right off the highway there, uh, and this spot uh, was no longer. Um, other great breaks uh, at uh, Long Beach. Long Beach in the 20s and 30s was really a major spot for California surfing. Uh, they had the national champions there and the uh, championships there in the 30s. Uh, great surf at Long Beach. Uh, here's another uh, shot of Long Beach surfing in the 30s. Um, and then they put in the breakwater to protect the harbor during World War II, and you can't surf at Long Beach anymore uh, unless you're really desperate. Uh, another spot known as uh, Dana Point, better known as Killer Dana, uh, 1960s or so, uh, and then today, Dana Point Harbor. Uh, destroyed a great surf spot. So these projects often stem from competing visions for the California coast, uh, in this case, harbors uh, for sport fishing and sailing uh, instead of a surf spot. 
Now there's another competing vision uh, in the past for the California coast, a crucial one. Now I mentioned the development of surferbia, that is these beach towns up and down the California coast. Now this was not inevitable and other people had different visions for the California coast that did not involve uh, recreation and surfing and playing around on the beach. Uh, it involved industry. And before Huntington Beach was surf city, it was oil city. And a fundamental question in the first decades of the last century was, uh, are places like Santa Barbara or Huntington Beach going to be built around tourism and coastal real estate or around industry? Summerlin Beach. And not just Summerlin, also Elwood. Uh, Elwood, of course, is a little more famous. The Mesa, big oil field up on the Mesa discovered in the 1920s. Uh, all of these beaches, uh, places in town uh, covered in oil wells. So in the early, 19, uh, early 20th century, 1910s, 20s, Southern California's uh, future looked more likely to involve wildcatters and oil field roustabouts than sunbaked surfers. You have these fierce political battles raging through the 20s and 30s uh, with the oil industry on the one side versus coastal real estate developers and tourism promoters on the other side. Uh, even the business-friendly LA Times sided with the beaches. Uh, and I quote, uh, wishing swimmers could cavort and gamble in the breakers and come out glistening with drops of pure salt water instead of having their bodies smeared with oil. Now oil, as we know, eventually lost that battle, uh, which opened up the beaches to surfing. So this is Summerlin today, what might have been, okay? But that was a result of decisions made in the 1920s, and this was, this was by no means inevitable. Uh, Oil was not totally out of the picture, of course. Uh, the legislation only drove drilling out of the surf zone, either further on land uh, or uh, into deep water. And Santa Barbara found this out the hard way in 1969, of course, with the oil spill. Uh, this is a local surfer here in Santa Barbara uh, coming out of the water in the middle of the spill. Uh, El Nino uh, winter, of course, the surf was fantastic. A lot of surfers couldn't resist, uh, but this is the price he paid. Um, the 69 oil spill, of course, the start of the environmental movement in America. Uh, I won't get into it. Uh, you can talk about surfers' involvement or more uh, accurately, lack of involvement in the environmental movement over the years, at least until recently. Um, okay, in the interest of time, I'll we'll kind of fast forward a little bit here. Um, you can also look at the effects on beaches of flood control measures, uh, the countless tons of sand that are trapped in all the flood control basins, uh, you know, in our local streams uh, around the LA basin. Um, tons of sand trapped in those basins that would otherwise replenish beaches. Um, the LA River is now a 50 mile concrete storm drain. Um, you could also look at the technology of sewage, uh, sewage treatment. Our civilization, of course, basically treats the ocean as a giant toilet. Um, humans produce 230, 230 million tons of excrement each year, uh, and there's another 6 billion tons contributed from animals, and much of that winds up in the oceans. Uh, surfers are literally swimming in poo um, in Southern California. Consider the fact that for the first half of the 20th century, the LA River was basically the sewage disposal system for Los Angeles. And there's great jokes about the Pasadena brown trout and things like that. Um, but sewage was not only from the booming human population, but also runoff from places like the old LA Union Stockyard. Uh, the LA Union Stockyard, the biggest stockyard west of the Mississippi, uh, one million cattle and pigs each year pass through it. Uh, and the LA Union Stockyard, Stockyard sat right on the banks of the LA River. Uh, so anyone care to paddle out for a few waves at the river mouth? Go for it. Uh, surfing could not have flourished without the development of sewage treatment systems. Uh, what happened was there were beach closures back in the 1930s, which finally provoked the city fathers to say, look, we've, we've kind of placed our bets on you know, beach tourism and coastal real estate, and now our beaches are closed because of all the crap that's flowing out in the water there. So we gotta do something about it. So that then spurred the development finally of, well, we all know the big sewage treatment plant, uh, Dockweiler, uh, Hyperion, uh, down by LAX, and similar treatment plants. Uh, but constant struggle to keep up with population growth. And I'm not even gonna go into the effects of climate change, uh, which of course are going to be profound for surfing along with the rest of mankind. Um, very briefly, a couple of uh, other interesting points here. All these coastal engineering projects uh, are not intentionally creating good waves. Uh, good surf is just an un unintentional byproduct. But some projects have tried to make uh, good waves through artificial reefs. Uh, Surfrider Foundation in the 80s tried to build a reef down uh, by Ventura. 
Uh, they called it Patagonia Reef after this co-sponsor. Um, there's another reef put in there, LAX, uh, called Pratt's Reef. Uh, this is done later by Surfrider, actually went in. Um, they've now since had to remove that. Uh, interesting issues of an environmental organization placing giant geotex plastic bags on the ocean floor. Uh, more recent attempts uh, in England, this is Boscombe Reef, uh, New Zealand, India. Uh, most of these are failures, uh, very hard to design a reef that can handle everything Mother Nature will throw at it. Uh, there's also problems of liability if a surfer breaks his neck on your reef. Um, and then there's a final step, which is to remove surfing from the ocean altogether. This development is known as the wave pool, uh, which promises to vastly expand surfing's accessibility. Uh, so for all those landlocked people who aren't lucky enough to live on the California coast or near some other coast, uh, instead you can now head down to your local wave pool for a surf session. Uh, this is an early wave pool uh, around 1912, opened in Dresden. Uh, they charged six tenths a ticket, uh, made about 500 bucks a day. Uh, subsequent models, this is Big Surf uh, in Tempe, Arizona, that well-known surf hotbed. Uh, 1969, that's Fred Hemmings uh, hanging 10 on a freight wave at Big Surf. And then there's later visions, uh, versions, Allentown, Pennsylvania, another noted surf uh, town. Uh, Disney World. Uh, I don't understand why there's a giant boat impaled on the top of a mountain. Uh, and there's subsequent versions, even bigger versions, uh, Malaysia, Dubai. Uh, there are now uh, dozens of these uh, uh, wave parks all around the world. Um, Kelly Slater, uh, another part-time Santa Barbara resident, uh, has now enlisted uh, USC aerospace engineers to design a better wave pool, uh, targeting the affluent surf traveler, who, traveler who's willing to spend uh, thousands of dollars to ride good waves. Um, also driven by uh, surf contests. Uh, so for surf contests, one of the drawbacks is you've got to sit there and wait for waves to show up, uh, and also there's no gate. You don't have a big stadium. But with a wave pool, you can have a big stadium, charge for seating, have TVs all around the place, TV cameras all around the place, good lighting angles, um, charge admission. Okay, just to wrap up here. Um, surfing is now high tech. We've gone from Hawaiians surfing natural coral reefs on wood boards while wearing bark loincloths or wearing nothing at all, to high tech uh, plastic boards, wetsuits, wave forecasting, and even artificial waves themselves. Surfers themselves ride the continental boundaries at the interface between civilization and wilderness, between modern society and the natural world. And there's a fundamental question here. What is surfing? What is surfing really about? Is surfing just about riding waves? If so, does riding an artificial reef or a wave pool count? How about a wave pool? Oh, this is a... Uh, wave park outside Brunsville, uh, Houston, Texas, uh, New Brownsville, um, which is basically you can go surfing in a parking lot. But even better yet, you can go surfing on the Lido deck of your next cruise <laughs> on one of these flow rider machines. So is this surfing? Does that count as surfing? Uh, riding in one of these wave pools on a cruise ship deck, is that surfing? How much is nature part of surfing's appeal? Uh, where do you draw the line? Do you draw the line at wave pools? Uh, do you draw the line at wetsuits, wood boards? How far back are you willing to go? What are you willing to renounce to preserve your romantic image of surfing? And this history is really about this tension between surfing as a romantic, natural, countercultural lifestyle and as a modern, mainstream, high-tech sport. And ultimately, this is really a story about surfing's constant struggle to save its soul. So I'm happy to entertain questions, and I thank you all for your attention. Uh, the Native Hawaiians used uh, koa wood uh, or willy willy wood, I believe. Um, depending on, uh, there was different sorts of wood reserved for uh, royalty versus the commoners. Um, they started using redwood. Um, redwood was actually imported in the 19th century to Hawaii. Um, for shipbuilding uh, and also for home building. Uh, and then they started using redwood at that point. Uh, so like Duke Ahanamoku and George Freeth, they were mostly using redwood at that point. Um, they'd kind of switched over once uh, redwood had started showing up. Um, but Koa and uh, Willy Willy were the original uh, as far as we know. But that's a good question. Um, yeah, we didn't, um, 
We don't have any really quantitative data on that, uh, but certainly anecdotal evidence is that uh, these internet surf workouts have made it uh, much easier uh, for people to surf, uh, especially people who don't happen to live a quarter mile from the beach and can't just go down and check it. Um, it used to be, you know, you have to drive, if you lived in the San Fernando Valley or even, you know, further inland, if you lived more than a half hour, hour from a surf spot, you're probably not willing to risk driving down to the beach to get skunked. Um, but now with the surf forecast, you can mouse click away and say, oh, hey, it's going to be, and the other thing is you can say, oh, hey, it's going to be good on Thursday, uh, four days away. I'm going to clear the decks at work. I mean, I know you do that. <laughs> I do it. Uh, the other thing it's done is uh, for surf travel and for big wave surfing especially, it's revolutionized it because now these big wave surfers, they can chase waves literally around the globe. Uh, and so spots that you wouldn't have been able to surf, I mean, there's this spot, uh, Cortez Bank, you know, there's uh, dozens of miles off the coast, uh, off the coast of San Diego, and you can go surf that now, but you wouldn't have been able to surf it if you had to go sit out there in a boat and wait for it to break. Uh, but now, with the surf forecast, you can say, okay, there's a swell that's big enough that's going to break at Cortez. I'm going to get uh, you know, my expedition boat loaded up with the jet skis and everything. I'm going to head out there, and I'm going to be ready when it shows up you know, in eight days. Uh, so big wave surfing, same deal. These guys chase and swell you know, to South Pacific, to Ireland, Iceland, Tasmania. Uh, that is really, uh, that's totally dependent on the surf forecasting. What's my favorite surf spot? That is a good question also. Uh, I'm going to give two answers. Uh, there's a I'm tempted to give three or four. Um, I mean, I, I love Hammonds and Miramar, uh, which are where I grew up surfing. Uh, so there's a connection. Just there's just kind of when I surf there, I just kind of feel at home. Uh, one of the funner s sessions I've had is out at um, Skunk Point, uh, out on Santa Rosa Island, the sand bottom, just because it's this really easy, user-friendly wave, sand bottom point. <clears throat> really fun to surf. One of the great advantages of this project was, you know, usually as a historian of science and spending a lot of time in archives, either in Washington, D.C. or at laboratories uh, scattered around the landscape. Um, and one of the great attractions of this project, of course, was we had to go do a little research in Hawaii, <clears throat> which was a uh, sacrifice for us. Um, and we worked really hard over there. But um, we also uh, managed to squeeze in a little surfing while we were over there. Um, just to, you know, immerse ourselves in the local cultural experience. <clears throat> but, um, so we'd go and we'd surf all day in the archives. I mean, we'd work all day in the archives. <laughs> Freudian slip. Um, but then there was one night when we went out, uh, we'd been working all day, and then at night we went out and we paddled out pretty close to actually where these guys are surfing right now. And the sun was setting, and uh, Diamond Head is kind of glowing with the sunset in the background, and the water's warm, and you paddle out, and the waves were actually probably about that big. You know, it's pretty small, but playful. And uh, we paddled out there, and you're kind of sitting there in the warm water, and you're looking out, and the sun is setting, and you start to realize the attraction of surfing for the ancient Hawaiians uh, and for people who go visit Waikiki. And you start to kind of get a sense of this kind of magical experience. And at, as historians, we tend to be fairly cynical about a lot of stuff, uh, as you can tell from my talk here. <laughs> um, uh, including surfing, you can be cynical about surfing and you know the environmental implications and pollution and sewage and all the rest of it, uh, not to mention the surf industry uh, and all these people trying to make money off surfing. But you're sitting out there in the water on Waikiki uh, and, or off of Waikiki and riding waves and trading waves with your friends and the water's warm and there's you know guys playing ukulele on the beach and you start to understand uh, why people surf in the first place. Yeah, surfing is interesting in that it's, uh, again, it's the split, it's, uh, this, so the question is basically what do we see for the future of surfing? Uh, with these technological developments, you know, where is surfing going from here, if I understand correctly? And, I mean, as historians, we're very, we're kind of reluctant to predict the future just because we've seen so many predictions in the past turn out wrong. But, um, you know, you can't resist uh, kind of thinking about where we go from here. The interesting thing about surfing is this kind of split personality, uh, this kind of romantic, uh, countercultural, anti-modern sensibility, and then the kind of high-tech sport, let's commercialize it, let's make money, let's make it bigger, how do we make it bigger, how do we sell more shorts, um, how do we get more people to watch pro contests. Um, it seems to me like this, the original side of surfing, this romantic side, kind of almost acts as a governor on the growth of the sport, or as a break on it a little bit. And that whenever surfing starts to get too big, 
Uh, there's a little bit of a surfers kind of tend to pull back a little bit. Um, and you see this recently in this kind of retro movement for anybody uh, knows, um, which I couldn't really get into, but um, there's a movement towards kind of retro equipment, including like some of the stuff the ancient Hawaiians were writing. So a move towards these so-called alaya boards, which are basically going back to the hand-carved wood boards. You put your foam and fiberglass chemical contraption, you leave that on the shelf, and you take out this you know, skinny little wood plank, and you go out and try to surf that instead. Um, and uh, there's been this kind of explosion in that movement, which I think is driven by, you know, the more high-tech surfing gets, uh, the more some surfers kind of hearken to go back to the roots and try to kind of pull it back a little bit. And I think surfing is it's almost unique in that respect in that how many other sports can you think of where people are giving up the modern technology and going back and picking up the old wood stuff? I mean, you don't see skiers doing, do you see any skiers out riding in leather boots and wood skis? Uh, golfers, uh, tennis players with wooden rackets, um, maybe uh, maybe rock climbing, where you know the so-called trad traditional climbers, you know, leave leave all the gear behind. Uh, but I think surfing is almost unique in that respect. In that respect, and that's I think one of the reasons why, you know, the more people talk about let's let's make it bigger, there is this kind of uh, counteraction to say you know we're going to kind of go back to the roots a little bit. And I think that's one of the things keeping that is that has kept surfing. Um, from getting bigger than it has. I mean, it's grown a ton, uh, but everybody says, you know, why isn't this bigger? And that's one of the reasons, I think. Uh, I do surf, but uh, work tends to kind of get in the way of surfing. In fact, you know, working on this book, the irony, of course, was there were days when the surf was good and some of these clowns sitting over here were calling me up going, hey, let's go surfing. And um, I had to stay home and work on the book instead. Uh, great irony, of course. Why? If I understand correctly, why is the history of surfing so important to us? Basically, what were we trying to do with this project? Uh, why were we working on the history of surfing um, as historians of science and technology? Um, and that's also a, a great question. Um, I think what we're trying to do is, again, a lot of the stuff that's been written about surfing has been written by, kind of, it's kind of this insider vision of, or version of surf history. It's written by people who you know, were surfers, were pro surfers. You know, Nat Young, Matt Warshaw, or uh, Drew Campion was an editor at Surf Magazine. They were all in the surf business themselves and the surf media. And they've got this kind of insular view on things. And we, you know, looking at surfing as a subject for historical research, we thought, you know, you could really do some interesting things and bring some of this kind of bigger picture history to it and have some fun with it uh, and kind of also, um, not really selfish, but, uh, Another motivation was to try to show, to try to bring more students to, or students initially for the class, and then <coughs> readers for the book. You know, not a lot of people are buying my and reading my books about uh, nuclear science uh, or aerospace, um, um, and this was a way to try to to try to reach some of those people and show them, you know, how historians, you know, how history can be interesting. Uh, and how you know historians can bring some perspective to subject like surfing, if not nuclear physics, um, and really give you some new perspective on something. So, on the one hand, we saw that the surf existing surf literature was not doing this, and then we kind of thought that you know this would be a way for us to kind of show you know what we do can be interesting, and uh, hopefully some people will read it. All right.